All right, everybody, welcome to Lake Springs Church. What a beautiful, beautiful time of worship we just had. Could we thank the worship team for that beautiful time? They prepare and they work hard. The tech team, all of these people just want to share the love of God with us through their talents and gifts. And I'm so thankful that you're here and that we can get to share this. Now, if you don't know, my name is David, and I get to lead this beautiful team and see these people week to week and just walk with them, and it's a beautiful thing. And uh, I'm here to share the word with you in the absence of our pastor Derek. He's over, as you saw, in India with the India team. And it must be amazing to experience life in India. I've never been over there, but it just looks so different, right? And it's so, so amazing for them to get to see God moving in another whole different culture because God is at work everywhere in the world. He's bringing life and light into this world through His people. And uh, I'm sure that as they went on this, I think it was week and a half uh, adventure in India, or even more than that, I'm sure that every day they just went to bed exhausted, because it was a long day of traveling. Traveling is just exhausting, especially uh, in a place you don't know, and in vehicles that are not the best, and, and in, it must have been really exciting, but I'm sure that when they, the alarm went off, they just jumped off the bed, because they were ready to see God move again, right? And that is an amazing motivation to have. I've been in other uh, mission trips as well, and that is the same thing. Even if there is not hot water, you just want to get in the shower and get out the door, even if there is no coffee, even if there's danger, because you know that God will do something amazing. And so in our lives, we also have motivations for why we get up in the morning. Some of us have, you know, the coffee maker on automatic, and it just starts, and we start getting that whiff, and it's like, you know, in the cartoons, we just get up and go towards it. Some of us have uh, little children, and the first thing that uh, we hear is a cry or little fingers knocking at our door. Uh, or maybe you get up because you have that fourth alarm, you know, the one that's way beyond your bed so that you actually have to get up. But the reality is we have all of us internal motivations for what drives us to get up in the morning. Some of us get up with, for our families. We want to provide for them. We want to make a secure space for them. We want to make our kids' lives better than what we had. Some of us get up because we want to achieve things. We want to learn things. We want to get better. And that's amazing. We, we sometimes get up also because we want to do good. We have that motivation just to do good, and that excites us. But the truth is some of us also have struggle, struggle with getting up in the morning. We struggle asking the, word, the question, why? why? Why even do it? Every day it seems to get harder and harder, and we have a job that we don't really like and enjoy. We are just getting by with the pay that we get, and it just gets harder. And maybe you're right, right there right now. And I'm glad that you're here, because today's word, I hope, will fill you with a motivation that is the hope that is Jesus Christ. So the reality is that all of us, all of us have an internal motivation and it's rooted in our hearts. So whatever your motivation for life and for living is, all of it originates in your heart. For millennia, for millennia, the heart has not only been used to describe the emotional center of who we are, but really the animating center for all that we are and we do. The heart is the motivation headquarters for human beings. In fact, for the biblical authors, it's not just a part of us. The heart is the center of all of who we are. So today, we're going to get a first glance at the motivation headquarters of Jesus Christ. Because if we are to experience Jesus as he truly is, we must understand what gets him motivated, what gets him out of bed. We must truly get what's on the, at the center of who he is if we are going to experience him fully, and we must see the heart of the Savior. And that is the name of our new series. We're going to be exploring from now till Easter, what is the heart of the Savior for us? So please, Let's begin by turning in our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. That's where we're going to be uh, for today. 
And uh, if you have a Bible, great. If you don't, there's the Bibles in front of you, and their uh, words will also be on the screens when we get there. But as you turn there, the reality is a lot of us know a lot about Jesus. We have heard a lot, a lot about him from our parents, from neighbors, from friends, from churches, from our Bibles, and there's a lot of places where we can get to know Jesus. But you know that in the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's only one place in 89 chapters of biblical uh, revelation of who Jesus is. Only one place where Jesus himself talks about who he is. Where Jesus himself describes for us his own heart. And although we can get to know a lot about Jesus from other people, it's, there's something absolutely beautiful and important for us to get to hear Jesus himself talk about his own heart. So let's do it together. Chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, this is the only time in all of Scripture when we get to see and hear Jesus talking about his own heart. And notice that as he does that, he is extending an invitation towards us. He not only describes himself, but as he does it, he invites us into his heart. He is saying, come and receive the rest that you most desperately need. Not the rest that the world can give us, but a different kind of rest, a rest for your soul. And how do we do that? He says, come and take my yoke upon you and let me teach you. And we're going to explore what that means in a moment. But he's saying, let me show you what truly being a human being means and how you created to be and how you created who you were created to live why the question is why why do why should we even do this why should we take his yoke upon him let, let, let him teach us why should we do this he answers that question by telling us who he is he says for i am gentle and lowly in heart jesus is describing the core of who he is and although he could have said, I'm dignified and exalted, I'm joyful and generous, I'm life-giving, I'm the author of everything, he could have said all of, those, all of those things, right? But instead, he says of himself, I am gentle and lowly at heart. So let's look at these two words first to begin with. First, the Savior's heart, our Savior's heart, is gentle. The Greek word here for gentle that's translated gentle. It's found only three other times in the New Testament. And the first is in the first beatitude in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says that the meek or the poor in spirit will inherit the earth. And this word refers to someone that assumes an attitude of dependence, of dependence of someone else. A person who realizes that they cannot do life alone, that they have to put their dependence on someone else on a life-giving connection with, in this case for Jesus, God the Father. That connection and that direction from the Father is what makes a person meek or gentle. Not demanding or oppressive, not trying to prove a point or hold to their own authority, but rather a person so sure of their identity, who they are, that they're able to give out of that, out of that assurance. That's why Jesus, in his three years of ministry, remember that he was on earth doing the most important ministry or service to humanity of all time, and yet he only spent three years doing it, and of those three years, he spent large portions of that time in solitude with the Father, in communion with him. He would get away and just be in him, because he knew that his success depending, the, depended on being with his Father, on the dependence and the connection he had with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And when you see, therefore, Jesus returning from that solitude to serve and be with people, what do you see? You see the most understanding and loving per person in the whole universe. A person that is not pointing fingers, but who is always opening his arms to others. And Jesus was the perfect human being. He was 
entitled, if anyone in the world, to point fingers and say, well, you, you know, look at me. I'm doing it right. You're not doing it right. But he didn't do that. We tend to do that, but he did not do that. He did not live a life of pointing fingers. He lived a life with open arms. What we find in our Savior is a gentle presence, fully ready to receive those who need to come to him seeking rest. And he says, come, and I will give you rest. That's his invitation. Let's look at the second word. So he's gentle, but our Savior is also, his heart is also lowly. Certainly these two words, gentle and lowly, they overlap, but they're telling us one unifying truth that we need to get about who Jesus is. This word lowly or humble, we find it in uh, many places, but we find it, in, a, for example, in James 4, 6. James says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And this Greek word, humble, not necessarily is referring to the virtue of humility, but it is referring to a sense of destitution, of being thrust downward by life or circumstance. That's why when you... Uh, when you hear this word, is referring to someone that is socially unimpressive, that is uh, not able to stand on credentials or on a social position or uh, any achievements in life. Think of Mary, for example. She was a teenager, and when she received the word of God that she would carry the son, his son, and the savior of the world, she expressed this in song. She said, God has favored one that is not thought in society, that is discarded. God has seen me in a lowly state as someone unimportant and unimpressive. And you know what a person that's socially unimportant and unimpressive and not famous has in common, all of them, is that they are accessible, accessible. Uh, on Friday night, we went to see Lauren Daigle. Last thing my wife got four free tickets, and it was my first time seeing a, a, a singer a concert. And it was amazing. 20,000 people came to see her, uh, beautiful songs. Uh, but what struck me is that she wasn't really accessible. Like people were like trying to touch on her. She, like, she, she uh, walked and it was like, hi, 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 hi. And the people, everybody flocked to her. But the one that saved humanity, the one that walked as God himself clothed in skin, he was way more accessible. He was always telling people, come. He was bringing kids and sitting, him on, on, on sitting them on his lap and blessing them and loving on them. He wasn't going to a green room and saying, okay, only certain people are going to come and receive my miracles. No, you have to pay an entrance fee. He was ready to receive everyone and anyone that needed help. He was lowly. He is lowly. He is accessible. And then he continues inviting us. Come, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. This is his invitation. Open up your heart. Realize that you need rest. And that's the bar. That is the bar. That is the only thing Jesus works with. You don't need to unburden yourself and come to him. You don't need to do certain religious things and come to him. You don't need to be good and come to him. You don't need to have everything figured out. In fact, he works with your burdens. It, they, it is your very burdens that qualify you to come to him. Isn't that amazing? He's unlike anyone else in the whole world. You can come to him because you feel burdened, and he wants to give you rest. And the rest that he offers you is a gift. It's not a transaction. It's for you to enjoy. Is that he wants you to be in a, in a space of rest and of, and of fulfillment more than you want that for yourself. And that is who he is. He cannot change that more than we can change our skin colors. And so we need to come and experience him in that way, as someone who's tender, open, welcoming, accommodating, understanding, willing. Author Dane Ortland, in his book, Gentle and Lowly, he says, if we are asked to say only one thing about who Jesus is, we would be honoring Jesus' own teaching if our answer is that he is gentle and lowly. Gentle and lowly. If Jesus had a Facebook profile or an Instagram, the only two words that you would see there are gentle and lowly. We would be honoring his own teaching about himself if we tell others about who he is in this way. 
that he is gentle and lowly, that he's ready to embrace you wherever you are. But the reality is not everyone experiences this reality. Even though we might know about Jesus, we might not be experiencing this reality. Those who refuse this invitation, they get something else entirely, right? So from verse 20 to 24 in the same chapter, Jesus pronounces judgment on those towns and villages where he had performed miracles and loved on people and yet only found apathy and rejection at self-righteousness. Jesus is gentle and lowly, yes, but he's not soft and he's not lacking of substance or authority. Jesus is only gentle and lowly to those who accept this invitation, who realize, boy, I do need rest. I need you. And they come and run to him. And he says, then, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. So this is the other part of the invitation. Gentleness and lowly, uh, gentle and lowly is who Jesus is, and that should fill us with hope. Because living a life that, and I'm going to talk about what all this means about uh, receiving his yoke and letting him teach us, but living a life in the way of Jesus is really, really hard in this modern age. The culture around us is going to be even more, even harder and harder for future generations because. Uh, there's inescapable suffering and toll in trying to go in the other direction of this whole world. As Paul says to the Romans, he says, do not conform to the ways of this world. Rather, be transformed by the renovation of your mind. And that is the kind of rest that we get when we come to Jesus, a, re a renovation of our minds and of our hearts. Living in blatant rebellion and opposition to the culture will bring us difficulty and suffering. And this is the more reason why we need to learn to enter into this invitation of Jesus of rest. And because only as we walk into his tender kindness, we will want to live a life that reflects his own and rejects this, the lifestyles of this world. That's why Apostle Paul, again, Romans 2, he says, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? The more you experience Jesus' kindness, the more you would want to come to him and away from sin. Only as we drink down this kindness of the heart of Christ, we will desire to turn away from the life that will lead us to destruction, to the life that is much different to this world's lifestyle, but that will lead us into rest. That's why it's imperative and fundamental that we get this, that we get to experience the life and the heart of Christ. That is the only way we're going to accept this invitation. So this invitation comes with also a petition. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you. So let's talk about that. A yoke is a heavy crossbar laid on the oxen, right, to get them to do hard work together. It ties them together and helps them to do the work in a unified way. But what Jesus is doing here is he's using a known metaphor, so everyone would know what a yoke is at that time, farmers. They knew what that meant. And then he's putting a twist on it. He's ba basically teaching, ironically, that his yoke is a non-yoke, because he says, my yoke is easy, and the burden that I give you is light. He's basically saying, my yoke is a non-yoke. He's basically saying this red is a blue. He's saying something completely, completely opposite of a yoke. Because he says my yoke is one of kindness. It's not an apparatus to obligate a behavior. It's more an apparatus for lifting the life of those who carry it. In fact, it has the same type of effect that a life preserver has on a drowning, tired person trying to uh, tread water and, 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 and keep alive. So imagine that you are in a stormy seas, in, in the cold and in the night, and you're getting tired of treading water. You're drowning, you're drowning kind of like Jack in Titanic, and you're there, and, and, and instead of drowning because you cannot fit in the door with the lady, uh, somebody throws you a life preserver. And I don't know what you imagine the response of Jack would be, but I to, I to, I'm telling you what he, it would not be. He would not say, look, buddy, I'm too tired right now. 
I don't want more stuff in my life. Let me alone and let me continue treading water, right? No. What would he say? He would use all the strength that he has left to thrust himself upon that life preserver, put it on, because he knows the function of that life preserver is to save him from himself, save him from having to try to live or to preserve his life by himself. If we really understand the nature of the yoke of Jesus Christ, that his yoke is like what he does to us, like what helium does to a balloon, what a life preserver does to a very tired swimmer, then we would thrust, thrust ourselves towards it and put it on and be relieved of the burden of our own try, of trying to live life on our own. That is the nature of Jesus' yoke. Yes, it unites us with him, but not to oppress us with heavy things, with religious obligations or structures, but to lift us up out of our own ways and into a life that truly gives us life abundantly. So when we accept this invitation and yoke ourselves to Christ, we're acquiring the lightness of the kindness and love and transforming nature of being in the presence of the one who created us, and we receive his calling and purpose and identity back from the world and from the things that have stolen it that we have done to ourselves. But the truth is that because we don't yet fully grasp this nature of Jesus' lifestyle, of Jesus' ways, we continue refusing that life preserver and going out on our own and just getting tired of life and our motivation for life keeps being put in things that will never fulfill us. Because we could, we could say that we want to be with Jesus, but during the week, our fellowship with him is minimal. We do the religious thing. We come to church. We do the, the singing. We do the prayer here. But when we go out of here, we refuse deep fellowship with Him. But what I'm proposing to you, what I, uh, I am inviting you to understand, is that solitude and prayer and Sabbath and all of these things that we might feel like are impositions if we don't understand it well, they are really things to help us live a life that is lifted up. But the reality is, some of the times, the reason we refuse this invitation is because we're afraid. We're afraid of what we could lose if we stopped trying to achieve and earn, or if we stopped living like others live and not have the stuff that they have and the success they have. If we stopped working in order to go into solitude because it necessitates to get away and to stop doing. If we stop distracting ourselves in order to enter into prayer, if we stopped putting uh, distractions around us that kind of help us to deal with certain things that we feel and we go through instead of resting in that Jesus wants to give us that kindness and light and life when we come to him. So. I am convinced that if you really, truly, truly get this, you're going to not want to only change your lifestyle, but it will actually get you up in the morning to experience this kind of life and to experience solitude and to experience prayer and to experience Sabbath every week because you'll start believing that these ways actually give you rest for the most important part of who you are, your soul. But there is another very important part is that in our heads, this is not how we intuitively think of Jesus, as someone open, kind, gentle, lowly. Because human beings tend to project our own ways of being to God. For example, someone, we think that someone that's beautiful will look down on the ugly, right? We think that someone that's rich will look down on the poor. And without realizing it, we sometimes assume that because it's so, God is so majest, His majesty is so amazing that He's so big that He must be so far away that He doesn't want to associate with the unclean. And this could not be farther for the truth, from the truth. Our natural intuition will give us a God like us. That's why we need our Bibles. That's why you need to get in Scripture and get to know the Jesus that the Scriptures reveal, not the one that your mind or the world tells you and our natural intuition deceive, deceives us to think of. The God revealed in Scripture will challenge and redirect and redefine our world-giving intuitions of who God is and how He acts. 
So let's look at that action. Let's look at Jesus' life in action because the Savior's heart proves his life. You know, Jesus doesn't just say, like, uh, just have faith in me and that's it, blind faith. No, he shows us his love in real action. That's why he did miracles. He made sure that other people saw his kindness and he also brings us the, in scripture his kindness and his love and now through his church we are experiencing that through coming to a place like this, through coming to a uh, um, uh, place like Celebrate Recovery or a place like the food pantry, we are trying to help people understand that Jesus is truly who he says he is. Just like, for example, Terminator. Have you seen Terminator? Terminator 2. Uh, that came out in 1991. And uh, I was way too young, but my dad took me to see it. I don't remember a lot, but I do remember a robot and being terrified. Uh, but the truth is that this robot was, in fact, a robot with skin on. That was a great re reveal, right? If, you're my, if you remember that scene, I'm not going to say anything about that scene. But uh, he's a robot with skin on. Well, just like that, Jesus is love with skin on, right? Jesus is love with skin on. And his deepest desire is to heal and restore and give life. That is who he is. That is his desire. Jesus, is re Jesus revealed his deepest desire by doing what he did. So, for example, in Matthew 9, he finds, Matthew 8, he finds a leper, and this leper uh, is, is, is just someone that no one wants to, wants to touch. Yet, Jesus says, when he asks him, what do you want me to do for you? He says, uh, I want you to heal me, and he says, I want to heal you. I desire to heal you. He's, he reveals his desire is to heal. And it wasn't just the leper. If you remember the guy that was brought in through the roof, the paralyzed man, when Jesus saw him, he didn't even wait for him to reach the bottom or to get acquainted. What's your name? Hey, my name is Jesus. No, he, what did he do? He said, your sins are forgiven because he couldn't help it. He was so moved by the faith of his friends, by the kindness, by his need that he just said, your sins are forgiven. Our need moves us, church. Whatever need you have, it moves his heart towards you. Whatever burden you have, he has compassion on you. You see it over and over again in Scripture, in all the gospel. He had compassion on them. He had compassion. He did not have uh, contempt for them. He had compassion for them. That is at the core of who he is. That is what defines him. By his own enemy's definition, Jesus is what? He is a friend of sinners. That is what he came for. He came for the ones who are sick, who realize their need for him. And that is the most vivid and arresting image of the life of Jesus as portrayed in the Gospels. That he moves and towards and touches and heals and frees and embraces and forgives those who least deserve it, yet truly, truly desire it. So the question for you and I today in the U.S. in 2024 with all this technology, with all these things that we have, is do we actually truly desire to be touched, healed, freed, embraced, and forgiven? Or maybe, maybe we think, you know what, I'm good. A word of caution, caution here, because we don't want to ever minimize the wrath of God and His justice. But sometimes we think that one rises as the other one falls, and that's not how it works. Really, if we are to understand the justice, the just justice and wrath of God because of sin and injustice, we must understand that His mercy rises and falls with it. So we must understand that as His wrath, just wrath because of all the injustice rises, so does His mercy. The reason why His mercies are new every morning is because His justice and wrath are there for all sin and all of what is wrong in this world. But we must understand that His main characteristic again and again is gentle and lowly. We are really only taking Jesus at His word when we realize that He is gentle and lowly and then it is impossible for him to be anything else or any other way. We must understand that this 
experience of his gentleness and kindness will lead us towards repentance. And repentance simply means doing a one, uh, uh, is it 180? Yeah, 180. Going from, from here to there. Running from uh, to life, towards life, from death. That's my favorite line of that song that Lance sang so beautiful, beautifully. Is running towards life from death. That's what repentance is. But we must understand that what he's inviting us to is not a religious activity. It's not a thing to check in our box of doing things. But it is He's inviting us towards a love covenant. Just as a wife and a husband say, I'm going to love you because I just do, that is the kind of covenant that Jesus is inviting us to, to surrender into his love, into his kindness, into his gentleness. Because it is our brokenness, it is our hearts that are in need that are most irresistibly attractive to him. That is why he came. To us, and that is his heart. So let's finish with this. This world, in this world, we're surrounded by sickness and pain and evil and injustice and corruption and death. It's the truth. To understand the heart of Christ is to understand that this brokenness in our world doesn't put him off. It actually attracts him. It doesn't repel him. It moves him towards us, towards his creation, towards what the, the, the ones that he created to be in loving relationship with. And when Jesus comes to us and he touches us, he doesn't become unclean. Actually, we become clean. We become free. We become restored. And he is in that type of ministry. That is his business, is restoring everything that the sin and the death and destruction has caused in our world. The restoration is his, his ministry, the restoration of all things to the natural order. We're, we're so used to the sickness and, and pain and injustice that sometimes we even think that that is the natural order of things. We might even think that God caused them to be. Let me be absolutely clear on this. God never intended for these things to happen to you, whatever you're going through. God never wanted that person to abuse you or that person to do that to you. God never intended for you to lose that child or to be in that horrible accident or have that horrible illness that you're dealing with. That is not natural. That is the cause of sin and death. And God is wanting and is in the business of restoring all of those things. When God intervenes supernaturally and heals and restores something, it's not that he is doing something, he's doing something supernatural, but really he's returning the natural to where it should have been all along. He is in the business of rehumanizing the dehumanized, and healing the unclean, of relieving people of suffering. He is love covered in skin. And today, there's an even deeper expression of the heart of Christ. Could you believe that? Because when he was here on earth for three years, he could walk the, the, uh, the streets and hug people and touch them. But today, because of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' Spirit lives inside of each and every believer in him. His Holy Spirit infuses us, and so through his Holy Spirit, we can feel the embrace of Jesus in our death, in our pain, in our suffering, even closer than any other time in history. And not only that, as I mentioned before, that Spirit enables his church to be the hands and feet that are in the business of restoring this world. So his actions prove his heart. Our actions as a church must prove our heart as well, must prove that we actually, truly desire for others to be touched and healed and be brought back from darkness into light and from death into life because we have done the same. So, whatever, wherever you are right now, the same question still remains for you and for me every single day. Do you and I, in this time, in this place that we truly desire with all of our being to be touched by him, to be healed from our sickness and pain, to be freed from our burdens, to be embraced and to be forgiven from our sins? Or do we just want to continue living the kind of life of treading water, of refusing the life preserver, 
just because we don't understand what that gives us, what that truly is intended to give us. So that is our invitation today, church. You're invited. I am invited. Come and receive rest for your soul. Get to know the heart of Christ throughout this whole series. I invite you to come every single week. And Derek is going to do an amazing job of inviting you into the heart of your Savior. Because he's inviting you. Take rest. Take upon you my yoke. Let me teach you. He's still repeating his invitation. Of all those years ago in Matthew 11, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So, do you consider yourself as someone who is weary and tired and in need of rest? Do you, do you consider yourself as someone who is trying to run the race and is getting tired? Do you consider yourself as someone who needs to be embraced? Let me give you this news. That's good news. Rejoice, because he is nearer to you than anyone else. He is attracted by you. He wants to be with you. He wants you to find rest. He was inviting you into that space of being with him, being with Jesus. It's all about receiving his heart. It's about understanding that all he wants for us is what we need most. So let him teach you. Let, let him bring you into for you to adopt his ways, even though they're so weird to the way that we live now. Being in solitude is so different from the type of uh, escapism that this world offers us with entertainment and all of the things that are, are the thing in our pockets, right? Being in prayer, so much different than what this world tells us that we will find life. Doing Sabbath, start doing nothing for a whole day, incredibly insane for this world. But all of these things are not kind of a crazy imposition of a crazy pastor or a crazy church. It is the life preserver that Jesus is offering you as he invites you. Come, receive rest. Come, get to know my heart. I'm attracted to brokenness. I'm attracted to your pain. I want to come and be with you. So close your eyes for a moment and we're just going to spend just a few minutes contemplating our Savior. So as we got this first glance here today, I want to invite you to just breathe in and breathe out. In this moment, wherever you are, whatever you came here with, whatever burden you came here with, or whatever burden is starting to well up in you that you didn't even realize you had, and picture Jesus right there in front of you. Just picture his presence because he is here. He is closer than ever before because he inhabits the praises of his people. This is a house of worship and he is right here because we have a need for him. And he is telling you, you don't have to appear like you try to appear to others, like you got everything together, like nothing is wrong. You don't have to pretend You don't have to put up a face of strength when you know that you are in the brink of losing it. You don't have to do anything. In fact, it is your very brokenness, your very burden that I'm attracted to. I want to give you rest. And I invite you. He's telling you, I invite you to experience this rest by taking up the yoke that I give you because it's easy. The burden I give you is light. It will lift you up. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Come to me. That is the heart of Christ. That is the heart of our Savior. God, we thank you because that is who you are. The only response to truly, truly experiencing your kindness. And sometimes we have to go really, really low to be able to truly accept help, truly accept your invitation. But But we don't have to. And I pray that whatever sway this world has in our hearts, in our minds, this lifestyle, and I struggle with it, everyone struggles with it in this room. God, I pray that your kindness and your gentleness and the availability of who you are are so, so real to us, become so irresistible to us, that we can do nothing but just come to you, run towards you, run to life from death. That is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.